we come to this state of deep, of deep gratitude, then that what are, what spontaneously or uh, what's what's mentioned in Japanese onozukara, what naturally kind of uh, uh, comes out of our of our of our uh, body is the voicing of the nembutsu, so that uh, becomes the recitation of recitation of the name Namo Amida Butsu. So it's it's kind of a call and a response. What's calling us? The world of absolute truth, the voiceless voice uh, that uh, calls upon us. And when we hear that, we then respond with this affirmation of, of the Nembutsu, the name of Amida Buddha. So um, the Nembutsu, I mean, obviously is not any kind of uh, uh, prayer or it's not saying that, or it's not a petitionary prayer. It's not asking for forgiveness. Right, and that, that's kind of a key thing here. When we say Nembutsu, we walk up to the Buddha uh, and we say Namo Amida Butsu. We're not asking for anything, right? We are not uh, praying towards anything or we are not uh, asking for any kind of forgiveness. Rather, what we are doing is uh, we are affirming uh, that we are uh, embraced within this one true reality, the one true reality that we, um, we call in terms of uh, a concrete form the immeasurable wisdom and compassion, the world of Amida Buddha, in other words, okay. So that's kind of uh, what was drawn out here um, in this layout uh, last night. The other thing was this uh, Nembutsu as practice. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. <clears throat> that uh, a question that comes up often, I guess, uh, when Buddhists, of different traditions kind of get together and they say, you know, what is your practice? What do you guys do? What does, you know, uh, then what is the Jola Shinshi response to that? And so, you know, the, uh, sometimes, you know, it might be um, easy to answer that there, that Jola Shinshi doesn't have a practice, right? um, which I, I see why the, that would be a response, but just to kind of, from a, from a doctrinal standpoint, um, just to answer that question very quickly is that, there is what's called great practice. And great just doesn't, it, it's not some word just to say, oh, it's, it's great, it's awesome. Great has, there's a, this is actually a technical term. And this technical term means that it comes from Amida Buddha, that it comes from the world of truth. That's how Shinan understands this. So the Nembutsu then is what is given to us. It's given to the sentient being and it's packaged as this, uh, the form of nembutsu that is then given to us. So if you can imagine kind of like a, a gift, you know, we're giving this really nice gift and that's the, the, the package itself would be nembutsu. What's contained within that nembutsu is shinjin, this, this true entrustment. In other words, the mind of the Buddha. What's given to us, the content of that gift is the mind of the Buddha, the mind of wisdom that is then uh, that, that becomes one with the sentient being in that instant of, of Shinji. And so the, the answer then would be, yeah. Uh, well, so the, the question was, you know, is, is it okay to then answer, is the practice then Nimbutsu? And I said um, that, yes, I think we can say that the Nimbutsu is our practice, right? But we have to premise that with this understanding of what we mean by practice as Jodo Shinshi Buddhists, right? If we're saying practice as in you should then say Namo Amida Butsu 60 times a day or 100,000 times a day, then, um, then I would say that that's, uh, that's not the way we would answer that. Uh, but, but, um, but we can say Nembutsu is our practice in the sense that what we're trying to do is come to the awareness of this uh, Nembutsu that is from the world of absolute truth. Right? And so that is our practice. To hear this Nembutsu, the name, is our practice. Okay, so um, I'd like to stop there and see if there's any kind of questions for me last night. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so let me then move on. Great. So today um, I'm going to talk about uh, the wasang, the Sanjo wasang. So the, the wasang are kind of, um, they're uh, a collection of hymns or kind of poetic pieces that were written by Shinan um, Shonin. And there's three sets of these. The first one is uh, 
So if you could go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. Okay. Um, okay, you could go to the next slide. Okay. The three works are known as the Jodo Wasan, Koso Wasan, and the Shozo Matsu Wasan. Hymns of the Pure Land, Hymns of the Pure Land Masters, and Hymns of the Dharma Ages. And the first two were written when Shinan was 76. The last uh, was written when Shinan was 85. Okay. So Shinan defines the term Wasan uh, in the section of Hymns on Benefits in the Present and explains that Wa uh, is the Wa uh, is, is means to make soft. And then san means to praise. So wasan, therefore, means uh, softened hymns of praise, in which he expresses in a much more simplified way how he understands and praises the Pure Land teaching. So one thing to kind of keep in mind is he wrote one of them at 76, and the next one, or two of them at 76, and then the next one was um, at 85. So this is like the later um, part of his life, uh, it, it, when his uh, um, ideas are starting to kind of... Uh, um, uh, they're they're matured and they're 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 kind of you know in its kind of con concluding stages if you look at his life so it's kind of like um um uh if you can kind of think about it is like in the beginning of our lives when we're children we like things to be simple right uh we um you know uh, our lego pieces are very big right we get a little bit older and the lego pieces get smaller and we start to get into more, more intricate games then we become adults and we start to you know, go off on um, adulthood and, and life gets very complicated with our relationships with other people and, and things like that, our workplace, right? And then we live our lives out like that in, in this complicated world where we complicate things and we are in a complicated, complicated situation, right? And then towards the end of our life, we kind of simplify things again, right? Everything becomes simplified. Uh, and, and so in that same sense then, what the Kyogyo Shinsho and, and the passages on the Pure Line Way are, are kind of what I talked about yesterday, they're kind of like these very complicated pieces of works, right? Uh, and then once that kind of foundation has been laid down, um, at the end, at the twilight of his life, he starts to kind of simplify things, right? And say that, you know, uh, uh, try to give us a very concise answer that is, that is packed with all this nuance, but um, is, you know, is very easily understood. It is very palatable. Um, to people of all kind of walks of life in all ages. So Nenyo Shonin, the eighth head priest of the Hongganji, um, kind of sees the benefit as, uh, of these, these wasan and sees them as these like hidden treasures, right? And so what he does is he um, uh, implements the wasan within the, the morning uh, services and the ritual daily services. So in addition to the Shoshinge that, that we talked about last night, um, when the Shoshinge is kind of like the... Um, uh, kind of like a condensed form of the, 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 the history of the Nembutsu teaching and the, the core of the Nembutsu teaching that's talked within, and that's talked about in the Shoshinge, which we chant, right? And the tail end of that, the second half of that would be the Wasan. And the Wasan are be, would be the simplified kind of poetic pieces uh, in which the, the lay followers can listen to and receive and, and kind of understand the gist of, of the Jodo Shinshu teaching. So that's what Nanya Shoni's big contribution was. Um, so, okay, so maybe we can go to the next slide. So then go to the next slide. So I'll talk about the hymns of the Pure Land first. And the basic outline of this uh, is that there's these preparatory hymns, and then uh, it moves on to the title and hymn from Gathas in Praise of Amida, a work by Tanluan, a list of epithets for Amida found in Tanluan's hymns, a list of three epithets for Amida found in the commentary, on the 10 Bodhisattva stages by Nagarjuna. So um, right off the bat, right here in the Jodo Asan, we see that um, Shinan Shonin emphasizes uh, Tanlan. And we'll, we'll talk about Tanlan in a little bit more detail in, in the Koso Asan. But oh, so this is kind of a, a key name to kind of um, kind of input into your head for, for, for right now. And then there's hymns based on Tanlan's Gathas that are three to 50. And then the list of figures involved in Shakyamuni's teaching of the three Pure Land Sutras. And then it moves on to the hymns of the Pure Land based on sutras and other sources, larger sutra, contemplation sutra, smaller sutra, and then hymns based on other sources. Okay. Okay, maybe we could go to the next slide. So um, from now to the next, uh, the Koso Wasan, I'm going to talk about some of the key points that come up within this hymn, okay? uh, within, within the Jodo Wasan. 
So the first one is grasped, never to be abandoned, which is seshukusha, which came up in yesterday's conversation. Um, so uh, this point is commonly used for the gosandai, the topic of Dharma messages. And I think I have it in the next slide. If you can go to the next slide momentarily. Okay, so here you go. Uh, seeing the sentient beings of the Nembutsu throughout the world's countless as particles in the 10 quarters, the Buddha grasps and never abandons them and therefore is named Amida. So um, I didn't write this here, but in the footnote of this, there's, there's some kind of explanatory notes that are written. Um, Shinan explains that uh, the Buddha grasps those who are trying to run away from the Dharma, run away from truth, right? And that, that um, so we're supposed to imagine that the Buddha is trying to grab the people who are running away from the Buddha. In other words, people who turn their backs away from the Buddha are the primary kind of uh, target, are the, the, the target demographic, if you will, of uh, people that the Buddha targets uh, to try to uh, uh, get them to awaken to the world of truth. Of course, what he's referring to here is all sentient beings, right? The Bongbu, right? And so that is um, what is being discussed here in this, this Wasang that's based off of the smaller sutra. So can we go back up the slide? Thank you. Uh, so Amida Buddha seeks to grasp the one that tries to run away. And this ties in with the teaching of Seshu Kusha, where Seshu means to grasp and then Kusha means to not throw away. Here, Amida Buddha does not just save those who are able to save themselves, but rather seeks to save those who are unable to save themselves. In other words, the bombu or foolish person. Another similar term is akuni shoki, or the evil person is the primary objective of Amida's salvific working. Um, so this is kind of um, uh, the explanation of akuni shoki. So the, the common example that's given to explain uh, this term akuni shoki, as well as seshu kusha, is if you can imagine that uh, uh, there's your parent and you have two kids, okay? And two kids are, are in, uh, you're on a boat, but the two kids fell into the, oh, the, the ocean, okay? And then one kid uh, is very good at swimming and the other kid does not know how to swim at all and is very kind of vulnerable, right? So as a parent, um, who would be the first person that you would try to save and to grab out of the water? it would probably be the person that cannot swim. Right? It would probably be that person. And then you would um, kind of, because of the, 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 um, the sense of urgency and the lack of time that you have, you would leave it up to the, the, the first kid that can swim on his or her own to kind of make it out themselves, right? And so then as the parent, you would try to go for the one that cannot swim, that is helpless and is hopeless and will, uh, is sure to drown uh, without your help, right? And so in that sense, then the, the teaching of uh, other power, Amida Buddha's Tariki Honga, where we call other power or primal vow of other power, the teaching that Honen Shonin brought to Shinan Shonin and what Shinan Shonin received is that he is this Bonbu, the person who has blind passions, who is unable to break free from the shackles of this, of this, uh, this human condition that, that he finds himself in. And because of that, he, he needs to rely on other power, on uh, uh, the Buddha's working to, to be able to pull him out of this world of, of suffering. Okay? And so that, that is kind of uh, what this Akuni Shoki is. Because sometimes when this gets translated, um, I'm, you know, I'm well aware of the fact that right here, a lot of people get stuck here, right? They don't like this word evil. I don't see myself, to, this term evil person is not referring to you are a bad person, you suck, and you're doing nothing but bad things, right? That kind of thing. What he's talking about here is what I mentioned a little bit earlier, the human condition, the condition that we find ourselves in, the, the condition in which we are unable to break free from uh, the, the shackles of blind passions, the shackles of, of attachments. That is what he's referring to here as the evil person. I guess an interchangeable term would be the egocentric, uh, ignorant person, uh, if that's um, some people uh, might like that uh, phrasing better. Um, let's see, another word that some people have an issue with is here, salvation, um, salvific. So <clears throat> I, I grew up Jolo Shishu all throughout my life. Uh, and so I personally don't have an issue with this uh, problem. Um, but um, I can see why some people do have an issue with this. 
Um, the reason why it's here and the reason why I tend to use this word is because it's very straightforward when I use this word. Uh, and then in Japanese, we have this word called sukui. Jodo kyo wa sukui no oshie de aru, right? And so, um, uh, so uh, in order to kind of save time and to be very kind of blunt and straightforward, I, I use this word. But another interchangeable word for this is uh, spiritual liberation. And then that's what I tend to use in my Dharma talks too as well, because um, I, I, I am aware of the fact that um, people who are coming to this tradition from, say, another tradition um, might um, see a problem or might, hmm, I guess, sense this you know, problem with, with, the, with, with these kinds of words. Let me stop there and see if there's any kind of questions or comments. Okay, great. Let's move on to then uh, the next slide. Okay, next one. Okay, so regarding each being as one's only child. So this comes, uh, this is known as ishiji or ishi in, in the Japanese, and it comes up in the Tanisho, but also here in the Wasan. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Just very briefly, when a person realizes the mind of non-discrimination, in other words, enlightenment, that attainment is the state of regarding each being as one's only child. This is none other than Buddha nature. We will awaken to it on reaching the land of peace. Okay, so if you can go back up one slide. So another important uh, concept that comes up um, in the Tani Show and other Wasan, here Shinan is explaining that when we attain enlightenment or go to the Pure Land, Amida Buddha treats all beings as if each and every one of them is the only child. And what this means then is that we become the working of the compassionate activity that seeks to save all beings as if a parent tries to save its child from danger. Okay. So Shinan regarded himself as this child of Amida Buddha. And this further means that when we are brought to the attainment of enlightenment, or birth in the pure land, this very life becomes the path in which we had to take in order to be able to encounter the teaching of Amida Buddha's compassion. And because each life is specific to each person, there are no two paths that can be exactly the same to get to Amida Buddha's pure land, to this world of enlightenment. Hence, it is as if we are Amida's only child, because our specific karmic path was the exact path we had to take in order to eventually get to Amida Buddha's great compassion. And this is the working of Amida Buddha's compassion. Whatever path we choose, it is a path that has been provided by Amida Buddha. And this is also why the phrase kashigi, or inconceivable, is used to describe Amida Buddha's working. So I'd like to kind of draw out what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> So if you can imagine uh, that this would be like the ocean here. Okay, and we're at the coast here. So I guess being in Hawaii, it's very easy to picture this. And then uh, let's say there's like the sun out here. Okay, and then this is the world of enlightenment, right? Which actually, we could talk about this later too, but we, we could talk about, uh, we could, it's interchangeable with the word pure land. Okay, uh, so let's say there's, um, here's person A, here's person B, here's person C, here's person D. Okay, so to, to each person has gone through their own kind of specific karmic path, right? And for that person to arrive here at this, this, this uh, end goal here, let's say this person took a kind of slightly windy, but not too straight, right? This person had like a crazy kind of jagged path, right? But then at the end, it straightens out. This person leads a relatively straight line, right? And then this person at first was straight, but then it got crazy like towards the end, right? But they all arrive here at this, this final coast, the final 
uh, point of this in, enlightenment, this world of enlightenment. And so what it's saying is that the, the specific path that A, B, and C, and D had gone through, they're different from each other. Each one has, a diff, has laid out a different karmic condition, a di different karmic condition or karmic path, right? But that was, for this person, the specific path that this person A had to take in order to arrive to this point. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this path and this person cannot switch. If I was to put B in the place of A, right, they probably would not, they, they would not land in the same place. Maybe they can, maybe. But this specific path is specific to this person, right? And so it is a unique path to this person, this path, and then this path, and this path, and this path. They're not interchangeable. And so that's the way that I come to appreciate this, this, uh, this term, one's only child, which is to say that the path that I had to take, the, the karmic condition that I did in my past, the fact that I went to the schools that I went to, that I grew up in LA, uh, and I lived in the West Coast of California, and then I, lived, I moved in Japan, and, and these kinds of things. All of you are going to have your own specific karmic path that you had to take in order to get to this point right here, right now, right? So what that's saying then is that your life matters, right? You are indispensable, right? In this, in, in the path that you're taking to come to encounter the Buddha Dharma, right? To be able to encounter the Buddha Dharma meant that you had to take that specific karmic path that you had to take, right? And that's, that's kind of what is uh, being talked about here in the term ishiji, right? ishiji. Okay. So that's kind of uh, how we can understand uh, this, this term here. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, and then the next one after that. Okay, so Tanan and his work, Gathas in Praise of Amida Buddha, also known as Sang Amida Buddha Ge. Okay, so the, um, the, in this work, Tanan explains, this is a work that was written by Tanwan, and it's discussed in detail here. Uh, and Tanwan explains that Amida Buddha and the Pure Land are located in the Western direction. He, pray, he expresses his faith in Amida Buddha and offers his praise of the Buddha's virtues. In addition, Tanwan explains the different sages and adornments of the Pure Land, along with the 12 kinds of light, which are Amida Buddha's wisdom. And so Tanwan greatly influenced Shinnan's thought, particularly on the teaching of Amida Buddha's other power, or Tariki. And so Shinnan composed 45 verses in the Wasan, the most out of, out of any of the seven masters. If we look at the opening statement, we see that Shinnan considers this work as an appendage or continuation of the larger sutra. So in our tradition, the three, the three sutras that are the, the, the core of, or the foundation of our tradition is the larger sutra, the contemplation sutra, and the smaller sutra, right? And so, um, um, but um, Shinnan respected Tanlan so much that he considers this San Amida Butsuge as an appendage to the larger sutra. So he's basically putting them on equal footing, the sutra, the larger sutra, and uh, Tanlan's commentary, or Tanlan's work, uh, Gathas in Praise of Amida Buddha. Okay, so that's that's um, the point that's being uh, made here. Okay, so I, I heard this when I was uh, going for Tokudo for my ordination, but you know the scroll of the seven masters. Okay, we don't have one here, um, but um, the, the the way that it's normally light, laid out is that there's it's a it's two, and then it goes two one and then two two. So two one two two. And that person that it's in one is Tanwan, right? And, and so Tanwan is kind of like the central of the, of the seven uh, masters within, and that's depicted within the scroll. Okay? And I remember hearing that uh, when I was going for um, ordination. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Here. Oh, okay. So it is stated in Gathas in Praise of Amida Buddha by Tanwan, Namo Amida Butsu, interpreting the title I call this work an appended scripture on the Buddha, Buddha of immeasurable life. In praising Amida, it also refers to the land of peace. And that's what Shinan is writing in praise of, of Tanwan here in the Jodo Wasan, not in the Poso Wasan, in the Jodo Wasan. Okay. All right, let's move to the next slide. 
Okay, so yesterday um, I talked a little bit about um, uh, the difference between life with a lowercase l and then life with a capital case L, uh, and that uh, when we awaken to this uh, great life, right, um, that this we, we come to the great undercurrent that connects all sentient beings together. That is muryoju, muryoju, right, immeasurable life. Okay. So in this one, I want to talk about muryoko, right, uh, the significance of light. So if we look at the list of names for Amida Buddha, we see that there's seven, 37 uh, distinct uh, epithets. Uh, in other words, another uh, ways of de de describing this light of Amida Buddha. And many of these names include the imagery of light. Light is the feature of Amida Buddha, who is the Buddha of light and life. Amida is, the, is, is, is there's known by two names, right? Amitabha and Amitayus. Okay, so Amitayus is uh, immeasurable light, and Amitabha is, uh, is immeasurable light. So light and life are metaphors of wisdom and compassion. Therefore, Amida Buddha is the Buddha of infinite wisdom and compassion. So if we look at the various verses, many describe what this light means. And if we look at the various verses, many describe what this, oh, sorry. Uh, in the presence of this light, there is not the absence of darkness. Rather, darkness is embraced within light. Okay, so let me just kind of uh, chart this out because um, it's easier to kind of draw this out and, and kind of put things into categories so that we don't lose track of what goes where. <clears throat> so what did I say? Or, uh, light. Light. This is true wisdom. Compassion. If you're looking at the onaijin, this is the candle. This will be the flowers. From a philosophical standpoint, it is the world of formlessness. Form. In other words, um, static or oneness. And then dynamic, moving, movement. So these are um, kind of like uh, the, the, the two ways that we can uh, look at the, uh, the chart this out to see how the relationship between one and the other. So um, one, we cannot have this without this, and we cannot have this without this. Uh, and that's... Um, so the reason why I mention that is because when there is wisdom, there must be compassion. The two sides are the same kind of coin. Right? Um, so when we uh, when there is this arising of what Shin uh, Shani uses the word jine, but uh, in general Buddhism we can use uh, hanya or uh, pradnya or prajna. Right? This manifests into form in order to teach and guide all sentient beings. So, so the key, and that comes from this key point of the Bodhisattva path, which is that in, in Mahayana Buddhism, everyone has to make it. Okay? There's no select few that make it, and everybody else doesn't make it. Or these people are destined to make it, the rest aren't going to make it. Right? Everybody makes it. If everybody doesn't make it, then, this, uh, then it's not truth. That's the key thing about Mahayana Buddhism, which Jodo Shinshu Buddhism uh, is, is part of, is under that umbrella. Okay? And so uh, how that plays out then is that wisdom and compassion are indispensable. They're, 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 they're not mutually exclusive. With this wisdom, you will teach and guide other sentient beings. How will you teach and guide other sentient beings? as nembutsu. We will return to this world of delusion as nembutsu to teach and guide other sentient beings. And that's known as gensou eko. Genso eko. Okay. So the other thing, um, if you look at the back of the statue of Amida Buddha, it says hoben hoshin. Okay? Hoben hoshin. Oh, I hope I can write this. Hoben. 
Here we go. Okay, got it. Okay, hobe and hoshin. And what that means is um, the body of com uh, compa uh, compassionate means. In other words, the body of form. So, so what that's saying, when that's etched in the back of the statue, right? what that's saying is that um, truth is manifested in form for our sake, for our sake. So there, let me stop here and see if there's kind of any questions or are there maybe terms that you might know of that might... Oh. Uh, okay. So this might be a non-dualistic kind of an approach to these concepts. Thank you for bringing that out. Okay. Yeah. So non-dualism comes here. Dualism comes here. But thanks for bringing this up because that... Um, Right now, in, in, in the, the, the trends of Buddhism that we see, right, there is a strong emphasis of this, non-dualism, right? Because this is a new concept in America, in, in the West, right? The, the concept of hanya, jinen, or all things are pratitya samupada, empty, right? The, it's, it's a new concept that's very distinct to Buddhism, right? Or, uh, yeah, to Buddhism. Um, but Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, has a very specific approach to this world of non-dualism. We go to non-dualism through dualism is the discussion. Okay? So, so if, if non-dualism is this, uh, I wrote it here, oneness, right? Just for intensive purposes of to, to, try, to try to draw a distinction, dualism is two-ness. Okay? So we talk about oneness through two-ness. And what that's saying, is that we're talking about this world of oneness as Amida Buddha, as the Pure Land, as uh, uh, this 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 um, location of non-suffering, where there's all these adornments there, right? That th these dis these very magnificent and beautifully described uh, uh, characteristics and features is this world of form to try to explain ultimately formlessness. And so that's um, what I mean by tunis here. Tunis or dualism means uh, using form to explain formlessness. Okay. There are other Buddhist schools that will talk directly about non-dualism, right? But the Jodo Shinshu approach is to talk about dualism through uh, talk about non-dualism through dualism, okay? and that's that's the um, the approach that Jodo Shinshu takes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. <laughs> is that kind of like going from the 17th vow to the 18th vow? I mean, the, I, I think it's the seven, it's the one where, you know, you 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 try, you know, you yeah. you go through self power uh -huh. in order to oh oh 1920 find, and 1920 yeah, yeah 1920 that, to the 18th yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's great yeah time. yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, I guess you could. Yeah, I guess that would be a way to talk about that. Yeah, self power to other power. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, I realized that uh, the topic got a little bit kind of um, um, a little bit uh, theoretical there. But um, an another example that's 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 given to describe this the significance of light, the symbol of light, is to imagine um, uh, this pitch black room. Okay? So in this pitch black room that you're in, that um, when it's it's so dark that you can't say anything and you walk around and you're like bumping into things and you're kicking things, stubbing your toe and that kind of thing. And there, you don't know where to go, right? And then you realize, oh wait, wait a minute, I have a flashlight, right? So then you try to use this flashlight and you flash it to see where you're going. But the flashlight that you use is very limited in what it can see, the, 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 the field of vision that's, that's possible there. It helps, it's better than nothing, but it's still extremely limited in this. Let's just picture this room that we're in right now, okay? That's pitch black, right? But let's say someone or something or through some kind of causal condition that the, the curtains of this, this room, right, is, uh, is open, right? And then in from the outside, in comes the, the, the brightness of this light, 
that, that comes in and shines in through this room and illuminates everything in this room instantly in that, in that one moment, right? And in that one moment, you can see everything in, its, in, in absolute clearness, in clarity. And you know where everything is situated. You could even see the dust, right, within this room, right? And that's the difference between um, self-power and other power. That's the difference. This, this flashlight that I hold is self-power. My wisdom is extremely limited, right? It's limited because I believe that I can control truth. I believe that this is something that I am in possession of, right? right? But it's, it, the absolute truth is, it has nothing to do with whether you possess it or not. It's not under your control, right? It's like gravity. It doesn't matter if you believe it in or not, right? It, it exists. Dharma actually means law or principle, right? It, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. It, it works on its own, right? And so when this light shines through, it is absolute truth that shines through and illuminates you in everything within that room. Okay, and so that's the way we can understand the significance of light, right? That Shinran Shonin uses this light um, not in a, well, he's using it metaphorically, right? To, to talk about the significance of Amida Buddha's working. In other words, the significance of truth that shines our and shows our true human condition for what it is. But it's not, it doesn't end on this self-deprecating note. It doesn't end on, on you beating yourself up because you know you, you have these attachments, but it's to show that you are you are embraced within this world of absolute truth, that you you are okay as you are, right? Uh, within this this world of truth. And so that's that depiction of the, the pitch black room, I think, is something that might be helpful to kind of um, show the significance of compassion and and light. Okay, great. Okay, so maybe we could move on to the, the next slide. Okay, so this came up at yesterday's conversation too as well, but um, the ocean metaphor comes up again within the Jodo Wasan. And so um, Shinan understands Amida's wisdom and compassion like that of the ocean. If we look at verse 18, we see that Amida described, uh, is described as the ocean-like great mind. And he states the following. Amassing a stock of virtues from the Buddhas, for, for sentient beings of the Ten Quarters, they bring them to entrust themselves to the universal primal vow. So take refuge in Amida, the uh, ocean-like great mind. The ocean of Amida Buddha swallows up our blind passions. And so ex to explain this example, um, if you could imagine, let's see which one is that. Okay, um, that you, when you're walking on, let's say, is there like a bay around here? Like in San Francisco, there's like Fisherman's Wharf, um, Pier 39. And I don't know if you've ever been there before, but um, Pier 39 is, the water is really dirty. It's very nasty looking, right? You would not think to yourself that you would want to kind of swim around in that water uh, or, or be in that water. Uh, but when we look at that, um, the the pier and, and the, uh, the pillars, right? And the barnacles that are on there, it looks very gross, right? And the water looks nasty, right? But when you look up at the ocean, the horizon, it's beautiful. The ocean is very beautiful. The beaches here are very beautiful, right? And so um, this, what you would think is absolutely dirty and absolutely murky becomes and is transformed into this ocean of oneness that is absolutely beautiful absolutely immaculate, right? Absolutely perfect as it is, right? How is that possible to go from dirty to clean, to go from uh, un, uh, defiled to undefiled, right? And that's what is used by the term here, fukashigi, inconceivable, that Shinran Shona uses. Uh, and fukashigi is, is the, the working of the world of truth that, that converts um, what, what and changes which should not be able to do this change, but is nevertheless able to make that change to this world of the undefiled. The bombu is not supposed to be an enlightened being, but becomes an enlightened being. How does the bombu become an enlightened being? Not through one's own self power, but through other power, through Amida Buddha's working. And that's how this bombu becomes the enlightened individual, right? And so, um, um, 
that's the, 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 what is being uh, described here in this, this example of the ocean. Okay. okay, let's move on to the next slide here. Let's see. Am I supposed to take a break in about like 15 or so? Okay, about five minutes or so. Okay. Okay, so another kind of uh, point that's talked about is absolute equality in the pure land or enlightenment. If you could go down to the next slide very quickly, it reads, um, in the land of happiness, Shravakas, Bodhisattvas, human beings, and devas all possess luminous wisdom, and their bodily features and adornments are all the same. Different terms are used for them only in accord with the forms of existence in other worlds. And then their countenances, dignified and wonderful, are beyond compare. Their bodies, delicate and subtle, are neither human nor deva. Theirs is the body of emptiness, the body of boundlessness. So take refuge in Amida, the power of non-discrimination. So there's a lot of terms here that are thrown around, but basically um, the, the, ba the main takeaway from these two passages is that uh, the world of oneness is the world of absolute equality. And this comes from, um, uh, in the larger sutra, in the 48 vows, the third vow talks about that all the beings in the Pure Land are the one same color of gold, have this golden color. In the Onaijing, then, um, are all the things in the Onaijing are absolute, or I'm sorry, in the Pure Land are absolutely equal, right? And so that's why in the Onaijing, when we look at the Onaijing, uh, the ornaments are all, or the adornments are all gold. gold. And that's why it's the golden color to try to de depict this, um, uh, this, this characteristic of the Pure Land that all things are absolutely equal, that there is no difference between men, women, or this, this, this um, discrimination between uh, the have and the have nots, uh, able-bodied or not able-bodied, right? Uh, all things are absolutely equal is uh, what is being talked about in, in, the, uh, in the larger sutra. Okay, so with that, why don't I go ahead and stop here uh, to see if there's uh, kind of any questions or comments or I think. Yeah, this, can, we, can we go up one slide? Oh, no, I just wanted to see that. Okay. Okay, so here it explains that all beings who are born in the Pure Land attain the body of emptiness, boundlessness, equality. They all attain the same wisdom that Amida Buddha has attained. So emptiness here doesn't mean like empty, like it's not there. Emptiness is talking about um, non-discrimination, uh, this, this body of um, equality. Great. All right, let me see if there's any questions. Yeah, one question. Um, are these wasans the ones that the ministers usually use to, you know, be, uh, to, to start a to start their dharma talk? The gosande. Yeah, a lot right. of these um are used. Uh, when you go for talk of the ordination, um, they do say um maybe there's some that you should kind of stay away from because they get easily misunderstood. Um. Like uh, for for example, the ones on the the, the section on doubt, um, and so um, uh, yeah, so so some of these wasan are are preferred over others, but yeah, in general, uh, they're used in, as the gosan day, and I use them frequently, yeah, because it's it is kind of like it goes straight to the point, and so uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like you're supposed to start off with you know uh, wasan from Shinran. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it seems. Very traditional. I mean, I don't know. If that's right. True. Well, another section that's commonly used is the the preface of the Kyogyo Shomondi, uh -huh. uh, the one that says "Ah, Guze no Goen Kasho ni Momo." So, like, um, there's there are parts like that, and then all throughout the Kyogyo Shinsho too, there are certain snip, snippets that are like very um, matter or very to the point. Excuse me. That um, that are that are used. In yeah. Yeah. I think it might help when. Our ministers use those wasans, mm -hmm. you know, is to try to explain it a little bit, like you did just did, yeah. you know, because many times it's a little bit deep for for most most of us yeah. to, you know, kind of figure out what 
yeah, yeah. where it's going. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it I, probably relates to the Dharma talk somehow, but right. you know the, yeah, it's making that connection. Right, I agree. Different. Yeah, there's there's a little uh, unpacking that's involved. Uh, yeah, because even uh, the the slide before, it, I mean, there every other word is there's there's a lot to be said about that, and so um, um, yeah, th there's a lot of kind of explaining that's needed. Okay, I think we're ready to finish up for this evening and, and part two. So, Rare Miyagi, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to kind of uh, continue on uh, into the Koso Wasan, but I think I'm going to try to uh, kind of pick up the pace here and uh, I'll kind of pick and choose uh, certain things that I will be talking about. Okay, so maybe if we could go to the next slide. Go to the next one. Okay, next one. Next one. Okay, so the Pure Land Masters is what we'll talk about next. Okay, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I'm just going to point out here that there's seven uh, Pure Land Masters Nagarjuna, Vasubandhu, Kanwan, Taocho, Shandao, Genshin, Genku, and Honen, or Honen. Um, so, uh, uh, there are two from India, so the two from the top, Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu, are from India. Tanlan, Taocho, and Shandao are Chinese pure land masters. And then uh, Genshin and then Hon and Shonin, we, we come to Japan. Okay? So this, uh, they're the kind of running joke that I use often is that there's two things that made it across Asia. The first one is Buddhism. And every country, of um, uh, every Asian country, country basically has um, they're, they're, you know, uh, a school of Buddhism, right? Their own kind of version of Buddhism, if you will. And then does anybody know what the second one is? The second thing that, two things that made it across the co Asian continent. First one is Buddhism. The second one is... Okay. Curry. Curry. <laughs> every, every Asian country has their own version of curry. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of like, I was like, oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's true, yeah. So anyway, um, of the seven um, Kanwan masters, uh, uh, kind of Shinan focuses in on uh, Tanlan and Shandao in particular. Um, these two are kind of um, um, centrally focused on. And so the kind of the, um, the way to kind of understand these two is that from Tanlan, um, Shinan receives the, the, the logic of the pure land. In other words, um, this concept of formlessness and form, uh, the, the, uh, what's, uh, tech, the technical terms are koryak sonyu, so the, the extensive and the brief, and the relationship of this extensive and brief, the relationship between formlessness and form um, is the, the logic, uh, is what he gets from Tanlan. And then from Shandao, he gets the kind of the emotional kind of um, um, the transformation that takes place within one's heart is, is what he receives from Shandao. And uh, the, an example of this would be the white parable. Uh, the parable on the white path um, is one example. Another one is the Nishu Jinshin, the two aspects of denaturalization, which comes up in the Kyogyo Shinsho. At any rate, um, what he, he receives from Shandao is kind of the emotional impact, the, the umph behind you know, this, this teaching um, is kind of uh, how it is explained. Okay, so we can go on to the next one. Okay, so there's basically um, how he chose the selection of the seven masters is traditionally attributed to the following. Um, the first one is each of the seven masters was himself an aspirant for birth in the pure land. So in every work, uh, this, this gets mentioned. Right? Everybody aspires to be born in Amida Buddha's pure land. The second one, each left writings on the Nembutsu teaching, so each specifically talk about um, uh, Nembutsu, Nyampo, or Buddha Nismirti, thinking on uh, uh, the, and praising Amida Buddha's virtues. And then the third one, each of their interpretations is distinguished and essential in the history of the deliverance of the Nembutsu. So um, if we look, about, look at how the Nembutsu teaching comes to arrive to uh, Honen, uh, Shonin, 
that there, the development, each of these seven masters was kind of instrumental and, and indispensable in the, 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 uh, the, the transmission of the Nimbus teaching from uh, India throughout the Asian continent and into Japan. So these are the three characteristics that he's looking at. So keep in mind then, it means that these, these seven are not exhaustive in list, right? There, there are other ma Carolan masters that, for example, Honen Shonin uh, cited often and, and, and used, right? And there are, there are contemporaries of Honen Shonin. Um, you know, I, yesterday I talked about Kuya Shonin, right? He's also a Carolan Buddhist uh, who wants um, Tendai Buddhism incorporated many Carolan aspects, right? And there are many people who, who made commentaries on uh, Carolan Buddhism. So my point is to say that it's not just these seven, but these are the seven that Shina Shonin picked up on for these, these three reasons. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. I think I'm going to leave this for another time. Uh, so maybe we could go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I have here in my notes uh, something that I do want to address uh, about this, uh, this relationship between um, the dynamism of Amida Buddha's calling voice. So, uh, another example that I like to give uh, is um, the, the the example of uh, the father and son at the beach. Did I talk about this one yesterday? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so as I mentioned, um, the Amida Buddha's with the the name Namo Amida Buddha. A lot of times people think it's I take refuge in Amida Buddha. Um, and which is actually the, the second half of this the, the story here. Okay, so the first one is uh, take refuge in me, Amida, or I mean I'm not really, you know, I don't I don't need, I don't think this is the only way to put this. I think you could also put it like refuge uh, to uh, Taking Make sure you call out to me and don't go, to, go off too far. So the son says, yeah, yeah, whatever. Doesn't really pay attention because the son believes that he can do it on his own and that he doesn't need his dad's help, right? And so he goes off and swims in the ocean and has a great time, has a blast. Like first, you know, he's having a fun time. This is great. You know, he's swimming like backstroking and like, you know, enjoying his time within the ocean. And then uh, after a while, he starts to think, okay, I'm getting kind of tired. Maybe I'll go in, right? Um, but as he's starting to go in, he's pretty tired. And then like the, the tide is kind of pulling him out. And the more he kind of tries to get back to the coast, the more the tide is kind of pulling him out. And the, there's this current that's, that's, keeping, yeah, that's tugging at him and pulling him out uh, further and further deeper into the ocean. Right? And so the more that he struggles with this, the more that he's being pulled out into the ocean. And then so at, uh, finally, at, at, um, he comes to a breaking point when he starts to panic. right? And he starts to say, I need help, right? <laughs> and so, and so he's, uh, before he even calls out for dad, before he even says that, the dad sees the situation and says, I'm coming for you. Wait there, son. I'm coming for you. And jumps into the ocean, grabs the, his son, and brings him back to the coast, right? And brings him to safety, right? And then the son then says, uh, dad, thank you. I don't know what I would have done without your help. I, I would have died out there. I would have drowned without your help. And so uh, that's kind of like the, the situation that's happening here, which is that Amida Buddha, the world of truth, sees the situation that we are in, the human condition of this bombu that is in, as I talked about yesterday, this human condition of not being able to break free from the world of suffering, right? And this human condition, which Shina also refers to as evil, um, 
is is this this hopelessness, the state of hopelessness that we're in. And so uh, Amida then, the, the world of truth, then comes in and tells us about this red knuckles, but, but tells us about this world of oneness, this world of absolute truth, right? And that is, this, this arrow here is the Nembutsu. Amida Buddha is sending this message, right, to us uh, uh, to show us a world that is beyond the boundaries of our ego self. Right? And so this comes first. This comes first. This is take refuge in me, Amida Buddha. Take refuge in uh, this world of absolute truth, right? If, uh, um, um, to kind of explain uh, that this, this is the world of absolute truth, okay? That is depicted in form. Okay, so it's not a god or a deity, okay? Um, but it's depicted in form, and it's depicted in also this form to tell the sentient being about this world of absolute oneness. And that is the, the case with the father jumping out into the ocean and saving the son, uh, bringing the son to the, the coastal shore, uh, and uh, the son then responding, right? Thank you. I take refuge in Amida Buddha. I don't know what I would have done without this truth coming to you without you encountering, being able to encounter this absolute truth. Okay, so that, that two-step process is the key. Okay, so that's, um, okay, there's one more point I wanted to talk about here. Okay, so uh, referring to this um, Buddha not being a deity or a god, I'm not going to take credit for this next uh, example. These are Umezi Sensei, the conversation I was having with him. Um, but um, there is Umezi, I don't know if you know Umezi Sensei. You guys know Umezi Sensei? He has this knack for like Dajare, but also he has like a knack for words. And uh, like, for example, he uses the word imperfectly perfect. That's still a sensei, you know. And, and so he, he's very witty with words. And so, um, uh, anyway. Uh, this is something that I, that I took from him. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. So there, there's the Bud Buddha, the Buddha, a Buddha. Okay. So let's start from the side here. Um, wait, wait. Let's start from the side here. Buddha is the world of um, absolute. Wisdom, of boundless wisdom and compassion. Okay? It's the world of, again, Tanya, or what Jinan refers to as Jine. Uh, what other words are there? Nirvana. And on and on it goes. Okay. Um, so, absolute truth. I've been using the word absolute truth all throughout this, this night. Excuse me, sorry. And then the Buddha, can you want to take a guess? Amida, Amida Buddha. Yeah, Amida Buddha is the Buddha, right? the Buddha. So this gets um, manifested as Amida Buddha, a Buddha, which is one of many. Mahayana Buddhism, we, we recognize there are more than one uh, one Buddha, right? And so, um, but one Buddha that emerged in this world, again, Shise Hongai, is Shakyamuni. Is a Buddha. Another one that's, that's talked about. The next coming Buddha, Maitreya. Uh, so, so this is kind of the way to do it, is... Uh, or to explain the difference between the three, that they're all the same, but they're expressed uh, differently. Um, and in the sense that um, Buddha is this world of, I guess, oneness, right? And, and so this, the word Buddha, technically speaking, should not, like, in your head, there shouldn't be, like, a person that pops up, right? It, 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 this is just a place marker. 
for lack of a better word. There's no better word to depict oneness other than to say Buddha. Because our, 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 our human reasoning is limited to only understand things in dualistic ways. So we have to use language to, to try to best accurately depict this world of oneness. And the best word that, that was come up was Buddha. Okay? And then so with nothing there, just Buddha is, is referring to all of these things here. When we say the Buddha, we're referring to Amida Buddha, that this gets trend, uh, manifested in form as Amida Buddha. And then a Buddha is that, uh, that a, a, a Buddha that emerged in this world to teach and guide sentient beings would be Shakyamuni. So this is kind of one way to see the relationship um, between um, these different terms and uh, this kind of very abstract notion and how this abstract notion kind of manifests in concrete form uh, for us to be able to understand. Again, for the sentient being, we do not have access to this, right? Were it not for Amida Buddha. Okay. So Amida Buddha is kind of the, the conduit in which to have access to this world of oneness, which we would have otherwise never have known. Why? Because we are bombu, and we only see things in our world. Everything, I am always at the center of my world. Right? I have, my glasses are like bon, bono glasses, right? I see everything in relation to me, right? So you're a good person, you're a bad person, you are worthy of, uh, of my approval. You are not worthy of my approval. I dislike you or I approve of you. Those are all based on my judgment of you. And my judgment of you means I am at the center of my world. Okay? That's, that's what it means to be a bon book. Okay, and then Amida is trying to tell us that is what's causing your suffering. And there is a world that is beyond this bubble. That is this world of absolute truth. Okay? So then sometimes people make the mistake of saying, this is the most important. Okay? This is the most important. And that's what sometimes people will say. Right? But Jodo Shinshi Buddhism, and especially Shinan Shonin, says that that's not true. Amida is just as important, if not more important, because Amida, if it wasn't for Amida Buddha, if it wasn't for Shakyamuni Buddha, we would not have access to this world of absolute truth. And that's why uh, form, dualism, is, is, is essential. It's, it's very important. We can't skip over this and just go straight to this in Shinan's understanding. In Jola Shinshi Buddhism, we can't skip over Amida and get to uh, we have to go through form. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, any thoughts on this? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see if we have 30 minutes on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the point that I really wanted to get to, I think it might take longer than 30 minutes, but uh, okay, I, I will try. I will try. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Okay, the next slide. So this is the kind of the place that I kind of want to talk about because it talks about this uh, um, this this the world of this everyday world and um, how this world how we can how Shinji can help us in, in understanding this 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 everyday world. So in normally in our everyday lives, if we could just if I could have you concentrate on this bottom part of this diagram first, um, we have. We, we try to pursue uh, uh, cultural values, or we try to pursue truth uh, through education and through things like government, 
to try to um, uh, um, uh, to find a higher truth, uh, to find uh, happiness, right? And so we employ things like material happiness, wealth and health, like being a good, per uh, being rich, right? Because by being rich, I'm not you know starving and thinking about my next meal. When I when I'm healthy, I'm not you know worried about whether or not I'm going to die tomorrow and these kinds of things, right? We also value things like love. Right? We also value justice. We we try to pursue truth, right, through logic and through you know um, uh, reasoning, and we try to pursue piety. Piety is basically you know what's right and what's you know, what's not right, avoiding what's not right and doing what's right, right, right and wrong. Uh, morality, basically, and then uh, beauty. Right? Uh, we try to uh, through like the arts, through music, we try to excel in, 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 in developing our culture, our, our cultural values, and the way we view this world through these different categories. Now, for each person, um, this order might be a little bit different. Maybe for some people, piety is the most important. Maybe for others, justice is the most important, right? Or for others, love might be the most important. Or maybe for each, that same individual, it might be this layout first, but then in 20 years or 30 years, they start to kind of uh, change in their worldview, and then they start, they say love is the most important. At any rate, these are basically the things that we try to kind of um, to uh, improve on, to try to develop on, to be to be able to have cultural values and attain uh, truth, to to be able to attain uh, happiness. In other words, right? But um, over time, what happens is we start to realize the limitations of of these things. And hopefully through the encountering of religion, uh, what religion teaches us is that these things are very limited. Right? These things are very limited. And we come to a kind of a breakdown, a, a, a limitation of that. And that comes to breakdown in which we come to this point of uh, the negation, the negation. And we call, and I wrote here a zero, um, as in um, that all of this crumbles down to nothing, right? It cr crumbles down to nothing. When we encounter the world of absolute truth, our value system kind of crumbles to nothing. Okay, so it, as I mentioned um, before, with Shinran Shonin, when he climbs the mountain up to Mount Hie, uh, he, I guess I don't need to draw this. He climbs up the mount, mountain right here, right, and then he practices for twenty years. Twenty years, he stakes his life on these different practices to try to attain enlightenment. In other words, happiness. Personally, I think what he was trying to do was fulfill uh, this 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 emptiness that he felt for, for not having this, the, the, the physical love that, or you know, the love that he would have felt from his parents, from his parents, right? He was an orphan at an early age. And I think that that, that gap is what set him off to try to uh, fill that void by finding uh, enlightenment through these various hard practices. And he tries to do this for 20 years, is unable to, then comes down the mountain, quite literally in a state of hopelessness and goes to a place called Dokkakudo, which is in like the heart of Kyoto. Okay, so he goes to Dokkakudo, and that becomes, uh, uh, and so when he goes there, he's in a state of absolute hopelessness, right? And then uh, it, his world crumbles, right, down to, uh, uh, to nothing, it essentially it becomes rubble. Um, a lot of times people think that he, him going to Dokkakudo was some kind of like seminar or some kind of retreat or something. You know, this is, well, this is life and death for him. Because this is all he knew, he knows. Twenty years he spends his life, right, staking his life out, trying to understand this, and his world comes comes down, crashing down, right. So he hits this kind of absolute low, right. But in this absolute low, he encounters Honen Shonin's teaching of Amida Buddha's other power, and that becomes this the fertile ground in which he is uplifted into this affirmation, right, of of other of, of the world again, right. So. This, when we encounter this absolute zero, this ground zero, everything comes crashing down, right? But then what happens thereafter, right, is that it takes, there's just that one moment in which everything comes crashing down, and all of this, we realize, is futile. It's pointless or meaningless, right? And if we're doing it on its own. But with this new understanding of Amida Buddha's other power, we then re-engage with this world Again, and, and then beauty, piety, truth, justice, love, and material happiness, we then pursue and engage in once again uh, as active members in society. And that's what religion is supposed to do. It's supposed to 
provide you uh, a path to uplift you, to, to give you a sense of hope and confidence in life, right? To then re-engage with life, right? To re-engage with these different uh, uh, with these different aspects of beauty and truth and justice and these kinds of things. But it does take this one instance, this, this transcend, uh, transcendence, uh, this, this one instance in which your cultural values breaks down uh, and you see the futility in all of these things, right? Because what happens is when you, when you are invested in these things, all of your eggs are in one basket in a sense, right? You're putting all of your stock in this world, right, which is impermanent, right? It changes, it's in constant flux. When you are recalibrated to zero, right, then you can re, then you re-engage by seeing uh, the, the um, you see that they're limited, but then you, you, you have this sense of hope in wanting to re-engage with society and, and societal values. So that, that is um, one way that we can think about you know, um, the teaching of Shina Shoni, right, is that when we have this religious encountering with the world of truth, and you see the, the, the in one moment, the, the futility or the, the meaninglessness of all things, right, we then uh, uh, we re-engage with this world and go back into this, this world of absolute life. So, um, Okay, uh, I, I will stop there, um, and I wanted to see if there's anybody who has thoughts on this, or kind of questions, or anything like that. I'm not sure if I quite explained myself as well as I wanted to, but... Um, Anyone? Sorry, just to add on. I'm sorry, I'll take your question in a second. But there is a. Uh, this is that line. What did you write on that line? Oh, this is a. It says what? Transience is imminent, and then uh, imminent. equals negation is affirmation equals zero. Um, I'm gonna leave that aside for now because I wrote this for a, 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 a master's paper, and there, like I, I talked about this in, in other areas. That so if you could kind of transcendence is imminent is. Um, we could leave that aside for a second, but negation is affirmation. Um, what I'm trying to point out there is this negation is this, the, the crumbling, right? The crumbling of the, the cultural values. And then uh, the affirmation becomes re-engaging with this, this world. That becomes the affirmation. Um, and that is the uh, uh, Shinji, basically. The awakening to this world that is greater than one's own. We then re-engage with the world thereafter. Right? Uh, and and, uh, yeah. Or, sorry, the, the oh. one point that I wanted to mention was uh, Shina Shani uses the words yo ito, yo ito. Okay? And so when, when we translate that, yo ito, that means, um, let's see, yo, yo is this world, ito is, um, what's the word? To reject this world, right? But so, but Shina Shoni is not saying that we should hate this world or reject this world. What he's saying is, to, is what's being pointed here, which is to see the limitation in pursuing these things on its own, just on its own. Truth, piety, beauty, for the sake of beauty, justice for the sake of justice. Right? When we see that these things are, are um, uh, what should I say, that the human reasoning and approach to these things will not get us to uh, absolute truth, will not get us to absolute beauty, absolute piety and truth, right? That uh, that is what he means by this, this term that he uses, yo ito. But then that yo ito has within it implied that while we do kind of see the, uh, the futility in these things, that we then we engage with this world, right? With, it, with an affirmation of this world. And that's the point that he's kind of making here. I mean, this, <clears throat> this makes a lot of sense, especially for, I think, folks who are, you know, converts, you know, to, to Buddhism, 
Um, you know, they have personal things that happen to them and they, you know, they crash and all their values aren't working for them anymore and they're looking, you know, for something. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, since, since so many Joe Shinshu uh, followers are legacy, you know, folks, mm -hmm. you know, that come through from, you know, uh, you know, family, you know, connections, you know, that, you know, maybe they don't, I mean, everybody's going to have a crash, but yeah. um, it seems to be maybe a little bit different sometimes for legacy folks mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I mean, I mean, there's one of the reasons of why a lot of, you know, uh, children you know, don't follow, you know, and, and have fallen away, you know, from Jodo Shinshu. Um, you know, so can you comment on, yeah, you know, cool. kind of like the, you know, legacy yeah. versus convert, you know, type of yeah. thing, because that's maybe yeah. part of what we need to figure out. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the, the, the concern with the, 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 so to speak, legacy, right, folks, is that, um, you know, when you get told by your parents you have to go to Sunday service, right, um, you can probably do that at a young age, but over time when you become an adult yourself, and you, you, you find that you're just going through the motions, right? It becomes very easy to see the pointlessness in religion, the pointlessness in coming to these services because the simple fact that you're not engaging with this on your own terms, right? Uh, you're, 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 you're forced to do this and now you're just kind of doing it out of custom or habitual kind of routine, right? And so this, this is not coming into play for you at all, right? You're just going through the motions of, Trying to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, to be a good child or be, you know, uh, to go through the motions, right? To to look like you're playing the part, right? Uh, but you, again, as was talked about yesterday and also tonight too, which is the point, which is that we have to engage in it, right? And I'm not saying that all legacy people are doing this, right? And neither am I saying that all converts are really actually doing this too, right? But there, there is this um, importance in seeing. The fact that we have to engage with this on our own terms. We have to question, what is Amida Buddha in my life? Why do I need Nimbutsu in my life? Right? And, and then and talking to other Sangha people, right? other, uh, the other ministers about this. Not just your own temple resident minister, but other ministers about this. And um, coming to seminars and Dharma talks about these things, right? Um, to, to engage with the Dharma, to then question it. Right? Uh, and, and be able to kind of verify its teachings for yourself. Um, so that's um, the, the kind of the point that uh, I think needs to be drawn. Um, and it, it can be kind of missed if, if, uh, if we, you know, if you're part of this kind of only for legacy. Yeah. Did you say that the line is uh, Shinji? Yeah. Or can we represent yeah, it? Right, right. Because you know, for me personally, I'm I'm thinking in terms of I'm going up this ladder uh -huh. that I'm bothered by all these different things, you know, if not maybe not love, justice, and so on, but you know, lately it's my health, right, you know, right. uh, that type of thing. At some point in at some point I would reach that Shinji through my religion. And I guess everything is, at that point, doesn't bother me? No, it, we, uh, no, no, no. So you will still have your, 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 your blind passions. And the, these goggles of blind passions will always be there with you till the end of life. But however, the, the way that we look upon this, this life, it, it'll be uh, a little bit different from before, right? There's a difference between when, when, when this part gets kind of cracked open, right, and you see that there's other, you see that there's this world that is beyond one's own egocentricity, right? Then what happens, I'm going to erase this part real quick. <clears throat> okay, what happens is that
you see that all sentient beings are in their own egocentric bubble as well as you, right? But that one instant, you're able to see this world of oneness that embraces everybody, right? When, when you wake into that reality, this, this undercurrent that unifies all beings, right? Again, great life with a capital L. You look at other people differently. And what's written in the larger sutra is this soft and gentle heart and mind. Right? We start to see other people as well as ourselves with a little bit of a more kind of um, accepting or a tolerant mind, a mind that's more, uh, uh, well, I don't know if forgiving is the rest, best word for this, but uh, accepting probably huh? might be the, the, the best word to use that. And so how we look at this world changes uh, based on this, this teaching, right? Despite the fact that we have our, our blind passions and that we still have these goggles on, right? And that's like, that's the inconceivability again, right? Uh, of, of the working of this, this world of oneness, which is that we can't take these goggles off, but we know that the world is, is, is there, right? Uh, this world of oneness. And that enables us to then treat other people differently treat other people with a little bit more kind of acceptance and more tolerance and more uh, 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 with a soft and gentle heart and mind. It's not saying that you're bad, right? It's to say, um, yeah, I have moments where I do that too. Yeah, you know, I know I have moments where I cut off people on the freeway too or I wasn't looking, right? And, and so, uh, so I, I'm sorry, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's this, uh, this soft and gentle heart and mind, I think, is, is what's um, different uh, from before and after. And that, that becomes a basis in which we, we engage with all of these things, right? With, with justice, for example, right? Perhaps we won't be, uh, let's say we're like a judge, right? We won't be so draconian in our measures, right? Or so punitive, right? Or we see the, the prison industrial complex not as a place to punish people, but as a place to rehabilitate people, right? Maybe the approach would be that way, right? And, and so um, that's how these things can, can play out. But it, again, the, the key is to say not that you have to do it in this way, but that we are, we are given the, the, the hope and the confidence and the, the ability to think about these things on our own unique terms. How best to use the Nimbus teaching in the world that we live in. Sentence. So I have two questions. Yeah. So one for this diagram, is this like for like a general all religions or is this like tailored to like a Jogo Shinshu perspective? Yeah. Like, so um, I didn't really want to talk about who I took this from, but I took this from my, my grandpa. And so my, my, my grandfather talked about this, but my grandfather was highly influenced from uh, Nishida Kitaro. Who, uh, who is a uh, Kyoto school philosopher who was not particularly talking about Jogo Shinshu, but was influenced by Jogo Shinshu. So, um, so I guess in that sense, to answer your question, yeah, it, it isn't just for Jogo Shinshu. Okay, because I was wondering too, like with the material happiness, if we're like supposed to let everything go, oh. then how does it manifest itself in presumably the Nirvana state, which mm -hmm. is above the line? But, right, right. And then the other question is for Shinji, like, is it like a one absolute state mm -hmm. or are there varying degrees? Like, mm -hmm. you know, he or you're better at changing than me and or is it yeah. like one state? Yeah, so there's a famous story about um, Shin Nai Shan saying that my changing is the same as Hon and Shun's changing. And, and there's other students that came and said, that's blasphemous. You cannot say that about our teacher saying that you're on equal footing with our teacher. And then, so then they go and talk to Hone Shonen about it. And they said, can you believe what this guy said about, you know, about your Shinji? And, and then Hone says, you know, what, what Shinan says is not wrong. He says, it's right. His, the mind of Shinji is the same Shinji because it is a Shinji that I receive. It's not my Shinji to give. And so uh, it's the same uh, Shinji that, that is being referred to. Another example that's commonly given is the well example. Um, so, um, I'm giving you all my Dharma talks. <laughs> I'm like worried that I'm going to run out of stories. I'm <laughs> sorry. But uh, uh, there's a well here. 
well. And so like uh, in this well, we, we go down and then here's the water that we're pulling um, water from. And so every so often in life, as we're walking in life, we hit this, this moment where we're being able to pull this water of wisdom uh, um, and it comes up and we're able to enjoy that. But then once we recognize that that moment is there, it goes away. And then we, and then we go on to kind of go on with our lives. And then again, through some kind of causal condition, we experience this, this well of wisdom again, this water well of wisdom again. How often this happen, uh, this happens is we can't, um, we can't gauge or we can't calculate. Uh, when it happens, we can't calculate and we can't will it to happen either. Uh, and so um, that's kind of the example that's, that's, that's given regarding um, this, the, the, this Shinji kind of awakening moment. Another one that's given is, um, I remember Kodani Sensei mentioning uh, the pendulum. Have you guys ever heard of this pendulum? Uh, so like the, there's, if you can imagine the pendulum that's swinging right in front of you. And every time it lands right in front of you, you have this kind of like oh, moment where you re recognize this world of this, this blue, right? This oneness blue. And then once you're aware that that's taking place, right? You're like, oh, hey, I'm in this moment right now. This is so cool. Then it like leaves you, right? And then it's gone. And then, it's, uh, and then he says, it's so funny because the older you get, that pendulum swinging is like faster and faster. <laughs> and so he says, that's why that's why all the Fujita ladies you know, they're like, they're always like this with the pendulum swinging like this. And they have these moments where they're having aha moments frequently. Uh, but, um, and so he was kind of just making a joke. But I mean, but it, he's kind of saying that it's, uh, it's kind of likened to this well example where that there's these moments where it just kind of like, uh, uh, like the, the stars align, I guess, if you will, you know, like that, that it, 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 it clicks in which you have uh, this, this moment of kind of aha, right? Or this, this moment of awakening to something. Uh, much greater than that. Any other questions or comments? Is it kind of like, and as soon as you go, wow, I, I get it. You know, like I have a clear picture now of what this all means. And then all of a sudden I go, that's so great of me. And then it's gone <laughs> because you yeah. think you're so, yeah. you got it, you know, right. you understand it. And you really don't. You right. only saw a little sliver. So again, this, when you think you got it, is this moment of, of, um, I am. I get. I can control truth, right? When 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 truth is mine and I'm in possession of it, that's when that's when you wake up. Yeah, because right? it's not it's not yours to be with. Yeah. So. Um. The uh, the Xinjing is a kind of a a, a tricky. Um, topic sometimes, um, but um, a, a, an example that I that came to mind um, that kind of helps with the discussion of Xinjin is kind of like um, um, the artifact in the museum example, which is that um, let's say like um, um, there's an artifact that's found in like the ancient uh, Egyptian pyramid, right? And so, so the artifact that's found is way deep inside the the pyramid, right? And it's this very beautiful artifact and it can be studied and all these things right and so then and then people bring it and they take it over to the museum right and they display it in the museum right? and then they study it and analyze it um, and and they, they try to you know give their interpretation they break it down right and they look at it from different angles and that kind of thing so study how, how old it is through carbon dating and all these different types of things right um, but the real significance of that artifact is it is it in the museum? Which is, you know, the, the the real function of it isn't isn't in the museum. It's in its original place, right? It's it's in its original place, which is in the in the pyramid, right? But um, that's kind of like the 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 Xinjing, right? Xinjing is like uh, 
we, we try to like say that it's something that we can get and then we like break it down and we analyze it and then we study it and then we say this is this is this person has it or this person doesn't have it or something like that but this the true significance of shinji is not in its discussion of it like by breaking it down and looking at it from an academic standpoint or these kinds of things the true significance of shinji is in its moment is in the the the, the phenomenon a phenomenon of it occurring when, when when we don't recognize it as shinji per se when we're in that moment and 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 you're just fully immersed in it uh in that in that moment that's the significance or the true um the true the true significance of, of, of shinji so going back full circle to where we started yeah. this evening with the nembutsu shinji nembutsu yeah. formless to form you know, when we say Namo Amida Butsu, how does the Shinjin relate, you know, to right. when we utter, you know, Namo Amida Butsu? Right, right, right. Well, that would be the, the, the this moment in which, yeah, yeah, that breaks through, yeah, the, the Nembutsu that, that cracks through. Um, and so, um, that would be the relationship, the the, the power of that the Nembutsu that works through, and and ha gets us to, uh, to to see what's out out beyond the boundaries of our uh, blind passion. So so each time we say Namo Amida Butsu sincerely, right? That's a you know Shinji is a is a part of that, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to just if we just do it in a recitation. Uh -huh. You know, like you know, mouthing it. Right. You know, if it comes from deep within. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, switch from back. I can say something about. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You know, spontaneous input. Right. Um. So, so the um, it's kind of like because another question that comes up often, right, is you know how do I know if my nembutsu is jiriki or how do I know if it's tariki, right? And, and the the truth of the matter is that you'll never really know. It, 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 it's always going to be jiriki. Like when we do the Sunday services and you say the nembutsu, those that's all jiriki, right? Because you're there's a time and a place where you're willfully saying it. And then say, let's say it together, and then say it five times, right? You know, that that's all jiriki, right? But it's only after you keep doing it throughout your life that you look back on that and you realize, actually, you know, I, I was saying that in my head as you know, it was jiriki, that was jiriki, but but I was being guided by this world of tariki this whole time that I was saying it, right? It, I just didn't realize it until now, right? That I was guided through uh, by by the inconceivable working. To come to uh, understand the true significance of nembutsu, which is not that I am saying it; it's that it is being uh, coming out from my mouth, right? And and that is the true significance of of nembutsu. So, um, you know, uh, you'll never kind of really know. Right? <laughs> and then you can say, like, my attitude is that what's matter what matters, and um, that's that wasn't the case either, because uh, 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 this is kind of where Shinran differs with seikaku, in that seikaku. Kind of uh, uh, says that your your the intention behind your nembutsu is important, but for Shinan, it's not it's you can't will that intention to happen, right? Uh, and so again, here it's this moment in which you're just absolutely kind of n not in that moment, or you're not perceiving or you're conscious of that moment. Yeah, I'm sorry if that was kind of an abstract answer, but uh, you, uh, there's this example that uh, that I've heard where the um, the, the teacher and the student uh, were their Jodo Shinshu, and the teacher was a Jodo Shinshu uh, teacher. And they were drinking um, at, at the teacher's house, right? And they were drinking together and having a good time, just talking and stuff. And then finally, the, at the end of the night, uh, the, the teacher then says, Ja, ima kara usu no nembutsu ima shoka. And so he's saying, well, um, Let's say, shall we now say the fake nembutsu? Shall we now fake the nembutsu now, right? And then what he was saying is, let, can, do you, let's participate in a service together, in Omaidi together, uh, and, and say this nembutsu that's fake. Because it is, it is fake in the sense that we're saying it out of self-power, 
But it is in saying it that we are hearing it as well, that we are being guided by this world of absolute truth. So that's probably why we say, just say, just yeah, say it. Just say it, yeah. Don't, say it. don't worry about right. if it's fake or, right. or not. Right, and, right, you know, right. Like, am I, am I saying this sincerely or? Absolutely, you know, yeah. I mean, just, just say it. Yeah, just you know? say it, yeah, say it, but just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just say it. But that, that just say it, right, is the conclusion. To get to that, we had to have this whole conversation tonight <laughs> from 6 to 8 right. p.m., right, to get us to this final conclusion of just say it. There's no um, calculation on your part that's, in, that's needed. Mm. It's, it's unnecessary. It's extraneous, right? And, and um, just, just come to say it. You are being guided in, in, in saying it. Mm -hmm. I know we're kind of over time, but... All right. Um, yeah. I'm hoping you answer yes, but... If I get to that moment of Shinji, will I know it? Oh, <laughs> so that <laughs> so that, the answer is um, so. Off the top of my head, the answer to that is is no. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a yes. But um, but so. I think, you know, the way that, how do I answer this is there's a different, there's a number of different ways that we can go about answering this, right? Because the, the again, when you say I have it or I don't have it, um, you're, it, it, it's our mind trying to say, can I get it? Can I control it, right? And I'm not trying to, you know, knock you. I'm not trying to disparage you, right? But that's just the way that the mind works. We can't help but to try to put things into our possession, into our, into our, uh, into our domain, right? And and that's what we do with Shinji. That's what we do with Nembutsu. That's why Nembutsu, we try to use it to try to attain enlightenment. It be, we try to make it ours, right? And so um, the the question isn't about whether I can get it or whether I can't get it. The, the more appropriate question is, do I appreciate having this teaching in my life? Does this matter in my life, right? If this matters in my life and I am grateful for my life, for being for have being able to encounter this teaching, then that's all you need to know. Yeah. Anybody else? Just finally, I, I love the expression of the of the illustration, um, the stick man and the circles around it. That's all I can get. So, <laughs> no, but I mean, do you think that is a, you know, really almost like a logo for Shin, Shin Buddhism? <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, in, in, inside, I mean, you know, if someone sees that on your shirt uh -huh. or something like that, uh -huh. you know, I mean, that's like a perfect expression of, you know, how the... That would be, that would be kind of cool, yeah. You know, you know how we... Spin our web around our uh -huh. ourselves and trap ourselves. Yeah, and, yeah. And hopefully you get, you know, a bolt of light, you know, that that penetrates yeah. that, you know, and that's kind of yeah, that yeah that, that's a that's a Shin Buddha, yeah. you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we're bone and mm -hmm. you know, but there is light. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you haven't patented it. Yeah, no. <laughs> Go <ahead and> those <laughs> <laughs> if you could make a nice one of this, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, we've we've come up against our time. We you know went a little over time because we're standing under that speaker. Um, you know, it's because of our technical, you know, uh, things, and hopefully we'll spare those up more uh, tomorrow. And tomorrow's lectures are going to be notes on essentials of faith alone and notes on once calling and many calling. So, um, you know, thank you everyone for attending, you know, this evening. And, you know, thank you to uh, Reverend Miyagi for the delicious pastries and the, and the uh, enlightening uh, lectures. <laughs> okay.